Hello, this is our lesson on test taking strategies. I'm going to walk you through the slides. Uh, because this is a video, if you don't understand something, go ahead and pause, go back and forth, skip ahead, whatever you like. So let's go ahead and start with some general study tips. Um, first, remember what we learned about encoding. Um, when you're studying for a test, use deep processing methods like subjective organization, re rewrite the notes that you've made in a way that makes sense to you. Use various mnemonic devices, create your own mnemonics, or make some that already exist. Um, use imagery when you study. Uh, think of mental pictures or draw little pictures that help you remember the information. Um, you could also try to attach meanings to the concepts that you're learning. Make a connection to your real life. Find some way to make it meaningful, relevant, or interesting. Um, in general, go back to the notes we took on encoding and use some deep processing techniques when you study rather than just reading over your notes. Speaking of deep practice processing, practice questions are a really good way to study for a test. You can, because it requires you to recall information and use it, and as we learned, the more you use information in your short-term memory, the more you're going to retain that information long-term. So go ahead and take some practice quest, uh, questions, do some practice tests, and then go back and think about the questions you missed and try to think about why you missed them and what the right answers are. This reflection is really important for helping you learn the correct information long-term. Um, the online textbook has a bunch of practice multiple choice questions with it. You can also find practice multiple choices on my AP Classroom, or you can contact me and I'll give you some. Um, remember drive reduction theory. If you're hungry or tired or you need to go to the bathroom or you're thirsty, you're not going to be able to focus as well. So make sure you take care of your body's needs before you go into the exam. And finally, think about arousal theory. We know that if we're stressed or if we have sources of arousal from other places, um, this can throw us off from our optimal level of arousal and from our performance. So we want to have just the right amount of mental arousal, not too much stress, but not too little either. Um, so try to reduce or eliminate other sources of stress in order to make sure you can focus. Now, when the test starts, try to write down the mnemonics that you've learned or any information that you've just reviewed in the margins as soon as you get the test so that you don't have to try to remember it long term. For example, remember when we learned about classical conditioning, I taught you the acronym VOICE, Voluntary Operant, Involuntary Classical, Easy, right? You could write that on the margin of your test, V-O-I-C-E, and write out quickly what it means. That way you don't have to remember it for the whole test. This is useful if you studied something at the absolute last minute and you're trying to just make sure you don't forget those five or six things before they pass out of your short-term memory. Um, it is really easy to miss questions because you don't follow the directions or because you didn't read the answer choices carefully. So make sure you're actually reading carefully, you know, put your finger under the words or something, make sure you're catching every word that's in the directions, take the moment to do that, to make sure you don't miss a word like not or accept, and then mess up the whole question because you're not answering it the right way. Okay, speaking of questions, look at the question first. Students often miss questions because they read them too quickly. I know a number of you have already had conversations about this school year that you're making what you would consider to be silly mistakes on tests from not reading carefully. So read the whole question, make sure you fully understand what you're being asked. Sometimes you could underline or circle what is the actual thing I'm being asked to look for here. If you can't figure it out, you don't know the answer to the question, you have no idea, skip it. Mark a little star next to the question, um, put a little circle around it or a line, make some kind of system for yourself. Mark the questions that you skip. Make sure you mark them on the Scantron or on the bubble sheet also so that you don't end up misbubbling your entire test. So if you skipped question five, put a little dash next to question five, skip it, move on, go back to the blank questions at the end, you might find something later in the test that jogs your memory. Some questions will ask you to look for the right thing. Other questions will ask you to look for the wrong thing. So look for keywords. Keywords are words in the test question that tell you what the answer is going to be like or what kind of answer you're looking for. Typically, they're distinguished in some way, especially on standardized tests, like they'll be capitalized, bolded, or underlined, or some other method. So on the next slide, I've got a number of different keywords that you might be able to look for that could help you um, figure out what the question is asking you. So here are some examples, not and accept. For both of these words, if they're in the question, you're looking for the answer that's different. All of these are methods of permissive parenting, except 
then you would look for the one that's more strict or more authoritarian. Um, each of the following is related to classical conditioning, except you find the thing that's related to rewards and punishments. Which of the following is not a type of attachment? Go through the list and find the thing that's not related to attachment, right? So you're looking for the thing that's different. Most or best, these ones are almost like value judgments. Find the one answer that's the most logical or makes the most sense. These are harder questions because sometimes you're having to make a call between things that are similar. So you have to look for like the sort of maximal answer. And then least is the opposite of most. You have to find the answer that is the least logical or makes the least sense, which one doesn't work, right? So looking for those negative keywords can help you not accept and least because we're look, used to looking for the best answer. We're not used to looking for the worst answer. So treat those as little flags that tell you you have to answer the question differently. Now let's move on to talk about answer choices. Read them carefully, especially in AP courses or higher level courses. There can be only really subtle, small differences between the answer choices and one little small thing like the term being not the right term or a little word like a not or a but in that answer choice can make it wrong. So read them carefully, read each word carefully, make sure you catch the subtle differences between the answer choices um, and pay attention to the question type because there are different types of strategies you can use depending on what kinds of questions you're being asked to answer. Let's start with multiple choice. Your tests in my class are multiple choice. This is probably the type of question you see the most often. Underline or circle the part of the question that tells you what you're actually being asked to do. Are you looking for the right thing? Are you looking for the wrong thing? Are you looking for a vocabulary word or a person's name? Are you looking for a description of a process? Whatever. Um, if there's a blank, then uh, this is really fill in the blank. Use the fill in the blank strategies instead of the multiple choice ones. So go like later in the video and use those. Um, but for multiple choice, a good strategy is something like process of elimination. You should know this one already. Strike out all the answers that you know are wrong. And then you have fewer to choose between. Some, each question will have some answer choice that's really obviously the wrong answer. And at least one, at least in my AP course, that's a distractor which means it's kind of right, but it's also kind of wrong. And so you have to try to, the distractors are what you want to try to narrow it down to. Cross off the ones that are obvious and then you're left with distractors. So it's easier for you to figure out what the right answer is because then you have a focus of where am I looking for subtle cues that tell me this is not right. Here's a practice question. An individual has been diagnosed with schizophrenia. Which of the following neurotransmitters is most likely to be at fault? Okay, so if I were taking this test, I would look at this word neurotransmitters. Sorry, right? Neurotransmitters. So I'm looking for a neurotransmitter. Um, so then I could look at the answer choices. Okay, is any of these not a neurotransmitter that we learned about? Well, endorphins are neurotransmitters, but like we didn't really learn too much about them. So I can probably eliminate those, right? So now I'm left with four things. Okay, let's see. Schizophrenia. So I know I have something that's like a disease or a bad thing. I have something that's at fault. Okay, well, I know that you don't, but I do because I've learned this course already. This, if this was a test, presumably on an AP exam, you would have learned this. Schizophrenia has symptoms relating to perception and hallucinations. So let's look at these other answers. Okay, GABA, um, that neurotransmitter has to do with inhibition, with slowing down your um, system. So it's probably not that. Schizophrenia doesn't have much to do with inhibition. So we can eliminate DNE. Now let's look at acetylcholine. That one has to do with movement and memory. Also not really super related to hallucinations. We can eliminate that. We're left with dopamine and serotonin. Um, so now you have a choice to make. One of these is the distractor. One of these is the right answer. And it's up to you to remember which of these neurotransmitters is related to perception and which one is related to like emotions and pleasure. The correct answer here is serotonin. Excessive serotonin in certain areas of the brain can lead to hallucinations. Some of the hallucinogenic drugs that we've learned about impact serotonin or look like serotonin. Um, so remembering that serotonin is related to hallucinations might have helped you there. But that's an example of how I would think through answering this question for myself. All right, now let's look, think about the multiple choice questions that have Roman numerals in the answers. I know you guys hate these Roman numeral questions. 
but make sure you're looking for the right thing. So are you looking for all the things that match some criteria or the thing that doesn't match the criteria, right? Which of the following are all prime numbers are you looking for? In that case, you're looking for the ones that match the criterion, the ones that fall into that category, which of the following is not a prime number, then you're looking for something that doesn't fit into that category. So make sure you read the question carefully. Then don't even look at these A, B, C, Ds at all. Ignore them completely, it doesn't matter. Just look at the Roman numerals. Figure out which Roman numerals answer the question correctly. Then look in the A, B, C, D choices for the answers that are right, that, for the answer that matches what you've already put. And if you don't have anything that matches, then you know you messed it up somewhere, you've got to go back and think about it again. Let's do a practice. Okay, which of the following theories most accurately explains pitch, per pitch perception? So we've got the word most, right? That means we're looking for some things that all fit into a criteria, into a category together. So we're not looking for negatives, we're looking for positives, right? And then we're looking for something relating to perception of pitch, right? So perception means how do we understand our senses and pitch is like the highness or lowness of sound, right? So we've got three theories here. Now I'm not even gonna look at these. I don't care about these A, B, C, D, E, ignore that. Opponent process theory, frequency theory, and place theory. So you might run into a challenge here in that you don't remember what these all are. Right? It's highly possible on something like this. Um, so let's start with opponent process theory. Opponent, now, we don't, maybe you don't remember what that is. Opponent has something to do with things being opposites or like fighting each other. So let's come back to that in a minute. We're not sure about that one. Frequency. It's more likely that you would remember that frequency and pitch are related, right? High frequency means high pitch, low frequency means low pitch. So let's go ahead and assume it's probably going to be two, right? Number two is going to be in there. Now place theory, you also may not remember place theory. Um, so we know for sure it's going to be two. We're not certain about one and three. So we can eliminate this top one because it doesn't have two in it. So we're already getting somewhere. It's not A. Right? Now, opponent process theory, maybe you do remember, maybe you had some enlightenment. Opponent process theory is about vision and color. That has nothing to do with sound, so it can't be one. So now we're left with two and three. So we can eliminate A, we can eliminate C, and we can eliminate E. So now we're between B and D. Is it two only, or is place theory involved also? And you have a much better chance of guessing right when you're only down to two options than when you have all three. And I'll tell you right now, place theory is about the place of perception of pitches in the cochlea. It is related to pitch perception, so the answer is actually D. Um, but even if you didn't remember that, you could have had a better shot of guessing right um, just by following some of these strategies that we've learned. So fill in the blank. Now, let's say you have a multiple choice question with a blank in it that makes it really actually a fill in the blank question, treat it as such. Or maybe it's like my test used to be, there's just a straight fill in the blank question, right? There are some different strategies for how to do fill in the blanks. First, determine the part of speech. And I know this isn't an English class, Miss Daniel, what are you doing? If it's a noun or a verb or an adjective, figure out what the sentence means. If the word is not gonna fit grammatically into that blank, it's not gonna be the right answer. So if you know, okay, this sentence needs a noun right here, you're not gonna need a verb. So you can eliminate anything that's a potentially a verb or an adjective, find only the nouns that will help you, right? I can't tell you the number of times I've had students on fill in the blank tests put stuff in those blanks that makes no grammatical sense in the sentence. Be a little smart about what, get, how you're guessing. Guess words that actually fit with the structure of the sentence because it's supposed to complete a sentence, right? Second, decide what kind of word you need to make the sentence make sense. Okay, it's a noun, but is it a place or a name? Or is it like a type of object, right? So in this example, the creator of the hierarchy of needs was blank. What kind of word is missing here? Right? Creator. Somebody does creating, right? So we're looking for a person. We're looking for someone's name, right? So that can help us really narrow down. I'm not going to guess something like phi phenomenon in this blank because that's not a person's name. So I'm only going to then pick names. That helps you narrow it down a lot, right? 
Once you've narrowed down what kind of information you're looking for, write down a few different options and then read the sentence out loud to yourself with each option in the blank. You'll be able to say, oh, that doesn't sound right. Right? Let's say I had three names that I could remember learning about in this unit. I had Bandura, I had Jung, and I had Maslow. Right? The creator of the hierarchy of needs was Bandura. That sounds weird. The creator of the hierarchy of needs was Jung. No, that sounds weird too. The creator of the hierarchy of needs was Maslow. Oh yeah, I remember Miss Daniel talking about Abraham Maslow. Right? So sometimes just reading it out loud to yourself or sort of under your breath can help you um, figure out what sounds the most reasonable or the most correct. So let's do a little practice. Blank twins are the same age and are usually raised in similar environments, but they do not have the same genetic code. Okay, so let's first try to figure out what are we looking for here. Okay, it's coming before a noun and the rest of the sentence is grammatical, so we're not missing a verb or anything super important. We're probably missing a describing word. We're missing an adjective, right? So we're looking for a type of twins, right? That makes sense. We need an adjective and it's describing twins, so we need a type of twins. So now let's think about what are all the types of twins that I know. Okay, I know about conjoined twins. I know about identical twins. I know about fraternal twins. And I know about separated twins, twins that are separated at birth. So first let's think about conjoined twins. I don't remember learning a lot about conjoined twins in the context of like understanding genetics and like nature versus nurture. So it's probably not conjoined twins because we haven't learned about that yet. And let's think about identical twins. Okay, well identical twins have the same genes, the same DNA, but the sentence here says they do not have the same genetic code. So it can't be identical twins. Separated twins, well, it's not separated twins because they're raised in similar environments. So it can't be that. So it's got to be fraternal, fraternal twins. They're the same age, raised in similar environments. They do not have the same genetic code. Next, let's talk about true-false questions. True-false questions are pretty easy because you just have to find one feature that makes the question false, and then the whole thing is false. So when you're doing true-false, you just look for one thing that makes it not true. All parts of a statement must be true for it to be true. If any, even a tiniest little piece of it is false, it's false. Um, when you have true-false questions with negatives in them, right? Um, a salamander is not a type of lizard. Okay, if you just then cover up the word not, a salamander is a type of lizard. Decide if that's true, right? If a salamander is a type of lizard, then the inverse, the negative statement that's in your test, has to be false, right? So that can help. Operant conditioning is not a method of behavior training. If you cover up the not, operant conditioning is a method of behavior training. Oh yeah, that's totally true. So the not makes it false. It inverts or flips the answer, right? A double negative becomes a positive. So if you can put another negative word in the statement, it changes the answer. Statements about reasons are usually likely to be false, especially if we're talking about um, psychology because a lot of our research is correlational. And so if you have causative statements in there, like because, right? Um, intelligence improves because of education. Well, we don't know that for sure. That's correlational research. So that answer, that question might be false just because of the word because. All right, so that can be a flag. Um, and then there are many other words which are qualifiers that sort of influence the meaning of the sentence and can make it more likely to be true or more likely to be false, can help you guess correctly on these. Um, so these words will describe how often or how likely something is, how often it is to occur. Um, first, we have absolutes. Absolute qualifiers or absolutes are things that, words like always, never, or every, things that mean each time something happens, a thing has to be true or false about them, especially in the humanities and the social sciences, like psychology and economics and geography and these other sort of human-related sciences. Absolutes are rarely correct. I can't think of a single thing in human psychology that it's true for every single person all the time forever, right? So if you have something like rewards always make a person do the behavior again, no, they don't. Operant conditioning is voluntary. You can decide not to do the behavior even if I paid you a million dollars, right? So because that sentence contained the word always, it's going to be false. Um, 
qualifiers that are about probability, like sometimes, seldom, few, often, frequently, generally, or ordinarily, are more likely to be true in humanities classes because they are less certain. Um, so it's like, well, you know, operant conditioning generally leads to a change in behavior. That is true because it's generally, not always, which is too certain to be true, if that makes sense. So if you look for, find absolutes, absolutes are usually false, and qualifiers of probability are usually true. Let's do some practice. Genes act as blueprints that always lead to the same result, no matter the context. So we know this first part is true, genes act as blueprints, right? That part is true, but now we have the word always. So even if I'm not really certain whether this answer is true or not, the fact that it says always should be a red flag to me that says, hmm, maybe it's not true, right? No matter the context. We've learned about a number of different things called sort of epigenetic things or environmental changes that can alter the way genes are expressed um, or the way a person develops. So the fact that genes always lead to the same exact result is just not true. Um, that word always makes that sentence false. And so because the second half of the sentence is false, the whole statement is false, we would say false. Next, let's talk about short answer questions. The strategies here are a little more general, um, purely because the answers have to be written. And so it's harder to just determine yes, no, right, wrong, and move on. Um, but make sure you know exactly what's being asked. Like with the multiple choice questions, it's easy to misinterpret a short answer prompt and get the question wrong because you didn't answer it correctly. Um, on a recent free response that we did in my class, for example, um, you had to give an example in the context of having, of, of an example of behavior change in the context of having a system where grades no longer matter. And the problem with that is that a number of people gave examples of behavior change, but didn't do it in the context of grades not mattering, and so then they didn't get the points. So make sure when you're reading it, don't freak out about the time. Take a moment, make sure you understand exactly what's being asked. Underline or circle some things so that you don't forget. Consider restating the question as a sentence at the start of your paragraph. Not every teacher likes it when students do this. Um, I'm sort of ambivalent, I don't really care. Some teachers want you to do it, some teachers hate it. But think about it as an option because it can help you get organized especially if the prompt is asking you for something kind of long and involved. It's easy, it's helpful to restate it because then you won't lose track of what you're being asked to do, right? Um, use complete sentences. Short answer questions are not asking you for bullets. They want sentences, so write in sentences. Use specific language. General words like things or events or sometimes. Put the actual object or event in there. Vagueness is the enemy of, of success on these. If you're going to be vague, you're not going to get points because we can't figure out what you're talking about. So don't say the battle was bloody, right? Antietam was bloody. And then prove it. it. Had the most sort of deaths of any Civil War battle or whatever, right? So be specific. If you're writing about the Civil War for a short answer question, be specific about which battle you're referring to. Because even if you're wrong, let's say you put the wrong battle name in there or you put the wrong date, the fact that you put an effort to put specific information means we can give you more partial credit than if you're just vague enough that we can't find any hope of a correct answer in there at all. Um, trying to determine what short answer questions are asking you to do, right? And these are some, what I've, I've calling them prompt words. Um, they tell you what kind of paragraph you need to write or what type of writing you need to do. And this is probably not news especially if you've had AP World History, um, because I know you in that class learn a lot about like different types of essays and what you're being asked to write. But if you have words like describe or discuss, you're just giving an overall description or details. What are the physical features? What happened in the battle? Um, what is the definition of some words? Whatever. It's pretty basic. Compare and contrast. Compare means similarities. Contrast means differences. You need to have both right? Compare and contrast China and the United States during the Cold War. Well, you have to say how, what are some ways that they were similar, like arms races or something. Contrast, what are some ways they were different, communism versus capitalism, right? And you have to put both. I can't tell you, every time I give a compare and contrast in a short answer question, I get students that only compare or only give me differences and they don't do both. You're not going to get full credit if you don't do both. 
um, the word explain. You have to talk about how or why something happens. You have to give details or steps for things. Um, you might have a question that says, describe operant conditioning and explain how it can change student behavior. Well, if you just give me the definition, operant conditioning is changing behavior based on rewards and punishments, explain how it can change student behavior. Okay, now you have to say, well, what are the steps? First, you do a thing, then you get praise for doing the thing, then you're more likely to do the thing again, which gets you more praise, which over time makes you have a habit of doing the thing. That's explaining, right? Explain why something happens. Why do people with schizophrenia hallucinate? Well, because they have excess serotonin in certain parts of their brain, which cause them to have perceptions that aren't real. That's explain. So you have to go into more detail and give some steps. The word apply means talk about something in the context of the situation or give a practical example. We do a lot of application in psychology. Um, like, here's a situation. Talk about this term and how it's relevant here, right? Um, how can operant conditioning change student behavior in a second grade classroom? Well, apply the concept of positive reinforcement. By giving kids a piece of candy every time they walk quietly to the bathroom, I'm using operant conditioning to change student behavior. That's application. Like practical real world examples. Evaluation is something we don't do a lot of in my class, but that you might see in things like history or English classes, giving a value judgment. To evaluate is to say, is the result good or bad, right or wrong, from like a moral standpoint or an overall goodness or evil kind of standpoint, which is why we don't do it a lot in my class. Um, but say, you know, is this a good or bad book and why? That's evaluation. And then you have to try to give some proof or support for that. This is something called Bloom's Taxonomy, which teachers use a lot, but you guys may not, may or may not have heard of. But basically, it's, it's kind of a pyramid of both difficulty and um, depth of work in a scholastic or academic context. So at the very bottom, we have words like define or discuss. Just basic facts. Just remember things. Then we have understand. Can you explain an idea or describe it in more detail? Then we have apply, right? Can you put something in context, use the information in a new situation. Analyze, this is what you do a lot in history, connect things together. This was like our compare and contrast, that's a form of analysis. Trying to explain the underlying reasons why World War I happened, that's analysis, right? Um, and you can see there's more verbs here that are related. Evaluate is about value judgments. Um, say what's right or wrong, critique something, and then create is producing something new. And so teachers, in general, the, um, when we first start teaching the concept, we start down here. And then as the concept, as we kind of build up our skills, we work our way up the taxonomy. Um, so this, I just put this in there to help you understand what the different prompts in short answer questions might mean. Okay, so this is a practice. I'm not going to pause the video and make you write the answer, but you could if you wanted to practice some of this. Um, you could pause this and you know, practice your short answer and see how much of the st of our strategies you've retained. Um, so the practice is, with reference to one research study, explain how a biological process can affect a cognitive process. Okay, so first let's figure out what the question is asking. We have the word, the, go to the verb, we have the word explain. Um, which if I go back through here, explain means to do something like describe in detail a process and I have to give some steps. Okay, so I gotta give some steps or details with reference to one research study. So I gotta make sure I include at least one actual study that we've learned about in this class. And then what am I explaining? Okay, how biology can affect cognition. Maybe I would talk about emotion and the theories of emotion and how physical arousal can influence cognitive arousal. And I would talk about such often to do and the two shortcuts, the two routes to emotion that we learned about in class. Or maybe I would talk about something else, but you could um, like reciprocal determinism, for example. So you'd have to make sure you include detailed steps, a biological process, a cognitive process, and an actual study, and sort of circling or just taking a moment to think through those things before you start answering the question can help you get it right. Now for some general tips. Tip number one, and this is probably the one that's hardest to do without practice, but can be really effective. Use the test to beat the test, right? 
especially in a class like an, like a test that's a really uh, long-term test, like an AP exam, you have information from the entire school year in one test. And it's in the information is in the questions that are written and in the answer choices that are there. So let's say you had a fill in the blank question about like, which researcher did the work on the cognitive route to emotion? And you have a bunch of names. Well, I don't remember. That was such an obscure name. Miss Daniel barely mentioned it. But if I can go find answer choices for other things, I might see the name there, and that might trigger some memory that can help me figure it out, right? Um, sometimes it's just that little reference that helps with retrieval. Um, sometimes you'll have literally charts or maps. Charts and maps are gold in tests because they contain gallons of information that you can use to figure out questions in the other parts of the test. So building your skills of reading a chart or reading a map can really be helpful when you're trying to figure out the answers on a test, right? So this is where skipping around comes in handy. I don't necessarily recommend taking a test in order, right? Sometimes it can be helpful to start from the back or to look through the test and mark all the places where the charts are and the graphs and the maps first before you even start, right? dog ear each page of the test that has a picture or a graph or a map on it, and then you can go back and forth to those as you're figuring out the test. I, I took an economics test where I couldn't remember some of the concepts, but I remembered supply and demand, and there was a graph halfway through the test, and I used it to help me figure out some of those questions I didn't know the answers to, right? So let's do a little practice on information gathering. Here we have a map, right? Um, so let's see if we can figure out some information about this map and what kind of questions might it help us answer. Um, so we're going to look for the title, Trails West. So clearly, if I remember some bits about history, Trails West, this is probably about westward expansion, right? Um, trails, right, we're sort of traveling along a trail, and we're going west, and that's when sort of Louisiana Purchase happened, and a whole bunch of people went west to colonize. I sort of vaguely remember that. So this is probably having to do with, like, the 1800s at some point. So this is probably a pre-Civil War kind of map. So let's see what else. I have a bunch of names of states and I have a bunch of cities and capitals on here. So I could use this to help me figure out like the location of a particular colony or group of people. If, they, if I see a state name or a city name mentioned in a question, I could come back here and look for where that state or city is and try to figure out the answer. Um, I don't seem to have really any rivers on here, so I'm not gonna be helped if I have any river questions. Um, but I do know that people tend to follow bodies of water. So if I have a river question, it's probably, um, rivers are probably along these different trails, right? And then I have the names of all the trails. So if there's a question of like, which trail was the most commonly used from Missouri to Oregon? Well, here's Missouri, here's Oregon. I can eliminate all the answer choices for these trails that are not on that path. So even if I don't remember it, it's between a few having this map here will help me go back and figure out the answer to that question, right? So there's a lot I can figure out. I can even figure out Mexico is south of the United States because here's Mexico, right? So there's a lot of questions I can answer by having access to this map. Here's another one, a graph. Now this graph has a lot of information on it, so this could really help us. Let's start with the title, Monthly Inflation 1872 to Present. Um, so we know we're looking at economic data here. And inflation is about prices rising. So this is probably prices in like dollars or like the rates of how much prices are going up and down. That's what this is a graph about, right? Bureau of Labor Statistics, annualized inflation rate 2.20%. What does that mean? Okay, Bureau of Labor Statistics, that's a government agency. So this is probably some kind of federal or like um, some kind of validated data. Annualized inf inflation rate, that's probably... Annual has to do with years, so this is probably some kind of year-over-year -year average, right? And now I have dates on the bottom, and I have historic events. So even if I can't remember, like, why all this stuff is important, look, I've got post-World War II, I've got Great Depression, I've got World War I, I've got stagflation on here, so I've got all kinds of terms I can refer to which, you know, president was involved with stagflation. Well, I've got stagflation on this graph and I've got the dates. So that will really help me remember or narrow down choices of presidents, especially if I have some other graph or question in a different part of the test that has dates for when different presidents were in charge, 
right? So now I could figure out that question, even not remembering hardly anything about it. Um, and I could talk about things like wars changing price levels in a short answer question, because now I have some data to demonstrate that. So overall, um, information gathering is a super helpful way to beat the test. Um, I remember lots of times on questions finding some piece of information, like, okay, this is the piece of information I need to fit this puzzle together and answer this question. So that point I made before about be careful about reading the questions and making sure you know exactly what you're being asked, that's really helpful because then you can figure out what information you don't have that you can't remember that you need. And then you can just page through the test, find the piece of information that you need somewhere else in a different question, and then go back and figure out your answer. Um, so this skill is probably the one that's helped me the most when I was a student, and I hope will help you too. Um, next strategy, trust your gut. People second-guess themselves all the time. The correct, the answer that comes to mind first is often correct, especially if you studied. Now, if you didn't study, your gut, gut is not necessarily going to be reliable. But nervously reviewing your questions and sort of hemming and hawing and getting anxious and freaking yourself out and then choosing the other thing because you're never right about this kind of stuff, that can do more harm than good. Put some kind of a symbol next to a question you're unsure of. Only review the ones you're unsure of. If you're pretty certain when you're answering a question, don't waste your time reviewing that question, especially if you are the type of person that second guesses themselves a lot. Next, be mindful of your attitude and what you're paying attention to. If you haven't learned this by now, your expectations really influence outcomes. So what you expect to happen pretty frequently is what happens. So if at the start of the test you're like really down on yourself, like I'm never going to be able to do this, I'm stupid, I do bad on tests, you're going to kind of shut down more easily and have a bigger struggle on the test purely because you're hamstringing yourself before you even start. So try to keep a positive attitude. Make a decision. I'm going to do the best I can. I'm going to answer the questions I know I can answer, and I'm going to do better this time than I did last time. So if you try to maintain a positive attitude, that can help. Don't let extraneous thoughts bother you, right? Don't worry about your ability, how other people are acting. Who cares if Miss Smarty Pants in the front row answered the test in 10 minutes? Maybe she didn't check her work. Maybe she wasn't ta taking the time to read the questions carefully. Your test performance is not about Miss Smarty Pants. It's about you, right? If you have short memory lapses or your attention wanders or whatever, just accept that. Um, some tests are timed and some aren't, but don't stress about the time, right? Just answer the questions. If you do your best on the questions that you do answer, it won't harm you as much if you don't finish. Um, try to focus on one question at a time, like fold the test over and just have the one question there. This can help if you have test anxiety, because sometimes seeing, especially if the font is little and there's like a whole bunch of questions all over the page, seeing that big pile of stuff can be really overwhelming and make you sort of freak out. So if you're kind of covering parts of the test that can help you focus um, and relax. I used to meditate before tests. Um, to slow yourself down physically, activate that parasympathetic nervous system. Right? Deep breaths. Breathe in for four seconds. Hold it for four seconds and then breathe out for four seconds. Do that for about five minutes. Forces your brain to slow down because you're forcing the rest of your nervous system to slow down. And that can really take the edge off of anxiety just by sort of working from body to mind rather than from mind to body. Um, some other tips that I've picked up from various people over the years for how to defuse test anxiety. Um, start at the end or in the middle. Don't start at the beginning. For some reason, not knowing the first question is much more demoralizing than not knowing the last one. Um, it's much easier to shut down if you're like, oh, I don't even know number one, what's wrong with me? And then you're sunk for the rest of the test, right? So start at the back, that can be useful. Um, decide at the beginning that you're going to use the entire time. That way you're like, I've already decided to use the whole time. So you're not getting anxious if you're running out, right? Or if someone else finishes ahead of you, you're like, well, I made a conscious choice to use all my time. So I'm going to use all my time and not stress about what Miss Smarty Pants is doing. Um, read the questions carefully. This one can help with anxiety because you're focusing on word to word and not thinking, oh my gosh, this is a giant paragraph. I'm never going to figure it out. If you can narrow your focus, you can help um, to be less anxious. So that is it for my lesson on test taking strategies. I know it was a lot. 
kind of grateful in that way that we're doing this in a video because you can kind of pause, go back and forth, reread, come back to it later. You have it as a reference. Um, you're not just sitting in a class listening to me talk for an hour, which I know we're kind of all over as a, as a group. Um, I have a practice test for you to take. I intentionally wrote it so that it would not be about anything that we've learned in my class. And I also tried to write it so that it would be unlikely that you would know or remember anything in the test. Right? So it's possible you might just happen to remember or know some of these answers, but kind of the point of the test is that you can get 100 on this test without knowing anything because I wrote it in such a way that if you use the test taking strategies wisely, you can beat the test and get 100 without knowing the information. Right? So it is designed for you to be successful. So if you can use the strategies well, you can be victorious. And so I want you to, I know it says you're going to share with your table if you have the opportunity to do this with a buddy, um, or you can maybe FaceTime each other or do a web call and like do it over chat or something together as a group, talk about it while you take it. That's really helpful to build a skill because what you're working on here is skills, right? Test taking skills. Some people figure them out. Not everybody does. And so I'm trying to help you build your skill here. Working together can really be helpful for that. Or if you don't have that option, um, keep a little piece of paper by you or something and write down the strategy that you're using while you're using it. And be obvious about it like, or say it out loud. Like, well, I'm going to read this question carefully and circle what it's asking me to look for. Or I found an absolute qualifier and I know that typically means the question's wrong. Or, oh, this is a multiple choice with Roman numerals. I'm going to cover the A, B, C, D, E choices. Right. So verbally talking out how you're solving it or writing down the strategies that you're using while you're using them can help you make these skills more permanent in your long term memory. So your task is to go and try to take this practice test that's attached to this lesson in Google Classroom. Um, I've made a copy for everyone so that you can submit them and I will put a grade in for what grade you got um, after you submit it. Right. So my um, expectation is for you to work on this over the weekend and try to finish it by Sunday night. So I'm going to give it a deadline of Sunday at midnight. Um, that way you have something to practice. And if you're taking the SAT this weekend, hopefully this will help you um, be ready for that. Uh, yeah, so good luck. I hope you all ace your practice test and can hone your test taking strategies. Uh, that's all for today.